Without missing a beat, the show returned the following year, a brand new network and a whole new era for the program. While the show would still be made in Eden Prairie, as it always had been, by the same talented crew as before, they would nevertheless be some changes. First and undoubtedly the most important was Trace's decision to leave the show. He jokingly said it was when he went to the unemployment office and had to list puppeteer as his vocation. Behind the scenes rumors were that he had departed because of something that I mentioned previously, that anything that they wanted to make here would be owned by Best Brains, so the only thing he could ever make here is MST3K. And while he liked that, as we've established, Trace is very much a renaissance man and wanted a chance to explore other opportunities that this was getting in the way of. Rumors suggest that even if the show hadn't been canceled, he would have departed anyway. This, of course, was a significant blow to the show. The only change more significant would be when Joel departed. Other people were much beloved, of course, but the masterful puppeteering that Trace did with Crow and a wonderfully deranged performance of Dr. Clayton Forrester were so synonymous with the program, it was hard to see how anyone could step into the man's shoes. Bill Corbett, a writer who had done some work in late season six and was now a member of the staff, got that job just a few days before they shot the first episode with the puppet. And it shows which Corbett himself is the first to admit, saying that Crow must have suffered a stroke to explain away the anemic puppet job that the season started with. It took a while for him to adjust and to stop trying to do an impression of Trace and make Crow really his own. But once he had done that, the character was working out quite well, even mastering the occasional dark places where Crow would have to go sometimes. Crow, why would you go make ahead, a dollar? Mike. Tickle him. No. Oh, I think you'd better, Mike. Tickle me, Carla Lombardi. Doesn't like to be disappointed. Well, I just, you know, just to be safe. Okay. That's right. <laughs> Tickle me, Carla Lombardi is your friend forever. Far more trying was to replace the character of Dr. Forrester. Obviously, there was no way that someone else could play that character, so they would need a new master villain. Mary Jo Peel, whom you'll remember had only six episodes as sidekick to the villain, was now seeing her Pearl Forrester character promoted. And that would be a truly daunting task. Remember that Mike Nelson was known to the audience before he became the host, regularly appeared in skits, beloved for the versatility of his performances, and there was still a massive anti-Mike backlash against him. Now let's take the other character who is almost, if not equally as beloved as Joel himself had been, and do the exact same thing. And just for fun, let's throw a tiny bit of uncomfortableness in there, because, let's face it, if this is how they treat a guy, how are they going to treat a woman? And a person of size, no less, as Mary Jo herself has used the term. This was quite clearly a pretty scary thought, and it shows great courage for both Best Brains and Mary Jo herself to be willing to go ahead with it anyway and let whatever backlash comes, come. Pearl was then given not one, but two henchmen, who would emerge over the course of the series, which I'll get to a little later. Going to the Sci-Fi Channel was in some ways like the move to the Comedy Channel for KTMA. Like the Comedy Channel, Sci-Fi wasn't available everywhere. A problem for some fans, obviously, because Comedy Central had become ubiquitous and allowed fans across the country to fall in love with the show, but now would be unable to watch the new experiments. And these experiments likewise harken back to those season one days, black and white science fiction and horror films. And it wouldn't be until episode 10 that they would look at a color film. What's more, season 8 didn't feature a single short, or any serials for that matter, which had offered some of the most beloved moments of the series. The railroad short Last Clear Chance produces even better material than the accompanying film Radar Secret Service. And a huge change was that, while the show is all about science fiction tropes, especially this season, and is about a satellite and robots, the powers that be at the Sci-Fi Channel felt that the only movies that should be shown were ones that could air on the network normally. So, no westerns like Last of the Wild Horses, no terrible cop movies like Mitchell, no teen films like Untamed Youth, no messed up Coleman Francis films like Skydivers, no cheesy 70s TV movies like San Francisco International. Although any of that were science fiction related could of course be used on the show, such as Riding with Death. Science fiction, fantasy, fantastical horror, those are the only things that are allowed in season 8. 
Those old black and white films did serve a good purpose in introducing a possible new audience to the show, because they clearly lent themselves to the mockery that the show would employ. The frequent appearance of John Agar provided a bit of a through line there as well, and the common tropes taking place between films such as Revenge of the Creature, as in The Black Lagoon, The Deadly Mantis, and The Mole People with its ridiculous introduction by some supposed expert. Another theory much closer to us. The Clown Hat this Theory. 1870 about a young American physician named Cyrus Reed T. had a revelation. We are not living on the outside of the globe, said T, but on the inside. That when we think we're looking out at the sun, we're really looking up Miss Johnson's skirt. No. No, the no, no. There's the hilariously misogynistic and racist The Leech Woman, and an appearance by the female changeling from Deep Space Nine in Terror from the Year 5000, and so many more. It was, in a sense, almost like comfort food in the turkeys that were offered up, schlock B-movies that anyone might throw a snide remark at. Once settled in, the show began to branch out then into other kinds of film, including the unpleasant film titled The Incredibly Strange Creatures That Stopped Living and Became Mixed Up Zombies. I was actually familiar with the film by its title because when I was young I used to read a lot of books about the history of horror in both lore and film, and that title had stuck with me actually allowed me to win a charades competition when we had to give a film title to the other team. Naturally, we got our film title out much faster. Another thing that sci-fi wanted was for there to be an ongoing storyline for the entire season to help compel people to come back week after week. This would, of course, lead to problems because on repeat episodes, well, they'd be aired out of order. Plus, another problem being that there are rights issues related to the films being shown. In fact, to this day, you cannot get a legal copy of two of the episodes from Season 8 because of issues related to the film rights. Despite that, though, and I'm probably in the minority on this, I admit, I really like the end result of it. I understand it took a lot of work behind the scenes and offered some constraints on what they could do, but the little subplots were just so fun. And given how the last season had ended and how things had changed, the situation certainly justified the fluidity that was the hallmark of Season 8. You might remember that Season 7 ended with the satellite reaching the end of the universe and everyone turning into pure energy. Season 8 begins immediately with them all being pulled back to their corporeal forms after five centuries on the edge of the universe and finding themselves back over Earth again. Of course, that means that at this time it's ruled by damn dirty apes and who are apparently led by one Professor Bobo. <laughs> well then, are we all set? All on the same page? Good. Human civilization is dead and apes rule the world. Everything you ever knew or loved is no more. Well, your movie this week... I'm sorry, but that gag just never gets old. That is, of course, Kevin Murphy under that ape makeup, and he's sending the movie because Pearl who has obviously had a makeover while being frozen, has been embraced by ape society as the lawgiver, and she has decided to carry on her son's experiments. So, they've got a new scenario, but it only lasts a few episodes because, in keeping with the storyline of Planet of the Apes, there's a cult of people who worship a nuclear bomb, and the apes are kind enough to help with that. Got it. Get troubleshooting here. Doesn't. Bomb has power, but will not detonate. Bomb will detonate, but people aren't dying. Now, here it is. Bomb has no power and will not detonate. It says, Peter, if you flip Jumper J8 in the motherboard, hey, you can hey, bypass hey, the... Hey, thanks for the help. I tried that already, okay? I, what I gotta do... I mean, you wanna keep it down? I'm trying to fix your bomb here! Well, Mike makes an off-the-cuff remark about how the apes could solve the problem with making the bomb go off. And so it will blow up and destroy the world along with them. However, during the five centuries, Crow had picked up some nanites at a county fair, and they modify the satellite so that they could drive it around like a ship because, well, it's a satellite. It's not really meant to do much of anything. Pearl and Bobo survive the destruction of the Earth, but are soon picked up by a race of super-intelligent beings called the Observers, who have evolved beyond the need for bodies only they still remotely control their bodies anyways using their mind, and they don't seem to have a problem with that. The idea with the Society of Apes was that, however sophisticated they might want to be, the fact is, they're still apes and they just can't shake the urge sometimes, or get past the mental limitations that that entails. The observers, on the other hand, are meant to demonstrate that just because you have a capability doesn't make you any more cunning. 
you may know more than a guy from the 15th century and have an impressive smartphone and stuff like that, but that doesn't mean he can't outsmart you. Same thing with the observers. Despite how much they go on about how smart and powerful they are, they frequently are not. Like in this salute to Finnegan on the original Star Trek. Oh, Mike, you got him. <laughs> hey, look, I don't know this guy. I've never met him before in my life. Oh, oh. Uh-oh. What, what do you mean? We cannot possibly make mistakes, so the error must be yours. Yeah. Yeah, so just yeah. think of someone else. To rescue Pearl and Bobo, Mike sends in the nanites to create a distraction, during which Pearl takes one of the observers hostage, and the trio escapes as the nanites' distraction turns out to be destroying the planet. Something that Mike really didn't intend to happen, but he catches a lot of crap over. Those three will now serve as the villains together, which was an inspired choice. You have the arrogant but occasionally dim-witted brain guy, as the observer is now called, to contrast Bobo, the frequently stupid but occasionally useful one, and both dominated by the force of Pearl's personality. She's basically the Mo of these three stooges, further emphasizing her new position as the main villain and giving her a sense of evil cunning that makes her role feel more natural rather than just her being shoehorned in to replace Clayton Forrester. The season gives us lots more adventures, pod people, Mike using a baking soda bomb to rescue the villains again, only to again blow up a planet, Mike being put on trial for becoming Shiva, destroyer of worlds, and a trip through time to the Roman era, before ending with a weird diversion into Pearl doing a PBS special. Although in their defense, the hideous PBS-sponsored film Overdrawn at the Memory Bank, shot on videotape and featuring a pre-stardom Raul Julia, is enough to drive anybody mad, especially when the beloved actor inexplicably says, Mom, my nuts. Mom. My nuts. My nuts? Season 8 also featured a recurring motif involving host segments intruding onto the theater segments, something that rarely happened previously. Sure, they would often have an in or out comment related to it, but in these cases it would completely take over. Some examples are swapping with a parallel reality where Mike is also a robot, Servo having his soul transferred into a giant Pop-Tart, and time travel resulting in Mike being replaced by his older white trash brother, Eddie. Wow, the present is amazing. That was absolutely incredible. Marty! It's me, your cousin Saul. Where's the phone? Marty! Let's get some blintzes, Marty! But however much things changed, the core of the show, riffing on movies, remained as good as ever. In fact, showed how much they were continuing to grow. I've narrowed it down to three as a tie for this season because there's so much good stuff here. The first is The Giant Spider Invasion, a low-budget Wisconsin-based 70s film involving a plague of giant spiders, with special effects so bad it makes the 1950s film Tarantula look like the most cutting-edge stuff coming out of ILM. Combined with the fact that the people making this film don't seem to know much about spiders, you wind up with what appears to be spiders gleefully stuffing people in their butts. Um, tell me, how does one of those gizmos work? A sandwich is dipped in batter and then deep fried? Second up is Jack Frost, another wonderful film in the vein of The Day the Earth Froze. It's a zany collection of madness, including a magical mushroom, an arrogant dude who's turned into a bear, a gorgeous girl who is horribly mistreated by her stepmother and stepsister, the titular Jack Frost himself, who's kind of like a cross between Santa Claus and Mr. Freeze. And this insane witch with a house on legs. I don't care how hard you try, I'm going to have the upper hand. Face me! Face the what? Oh no. No, no leg kicks, please. Face me! Face the what? And finally, Space Mutiny, which in many ways challenges the cheapness of both the giant spider invasion and overdrawn at the memory bank. For one thing, they're so broke they can't actually afford any special effects. They have used obvious clips of Battlestar Galactica. They could not afford to reach the heights that a 1970s television show could. The ridiculously buffed hero, who is given nicknames such as Punch Rock Groin, Smash Lamp Jaw, and my personal favorite, Big Mick Large Huge, inexplicably screams like a woman during action scenes, there are two harrowing chase scenes which involve what are effectively golf carts, 
and a sense of continuity so poor that a major plot point is the killing of a woman only to have her prominently featured as an extra later in the film. It's hard to believe anyone willingly made this movie. And our brave hero roasts the disabled man. Season 8 did quite well, and the show was renewed for a ninth season, and with a few more tweaks to it. But we'll take a look at those next time.